My name is Jamie Gregg, and my husband and I, um, Stephen, lead a ministry here in Southern California called um, Saved by Truth. And we've had um, this ministry going really out of our home for about the last, I would say, six years maybe. Um, maybe five. <laughs> Not sure. But we've been, um, we've been blessed enough to honor the Sabbath and Holy Days for about ten years now. And we're so thankful um, that you all are here with us um, to join us at this time. So I'd like to um, open us in a prayer, and then we're going to go ahead and um, have Stephen come up, and then we're going to start with some worship to prepare our hearts for the service. So let's pray. Um, Father God in heaven, we just come before you right now, and we're so thankful just to be here. Uh, Father, thank you so much for all the people around the world um, celebrating this day. Uh, Father, in honor of you on your holy days. Father, thank you for the miracles that you did um, in Acts. Um, when Peter preached to the people and 3,000 people were added um, to the body of Christ that day. And Father, we know even today, Father, that you're doing miracles. Even though the dark, um, there's such darkness going on in the world um, at this time, Father, that you are the light of the world. And Father, thank you for putting your spirit in us. And we pray over this ministry um, here and nationwide, Father, that you, and worldwide, that you can just, um, Father, please, Father, help us to shine even brighter. Father, please deepen our convictions. Father, please help us to be a voice of truth and boldness. And we just pray over the service that it will bring you glory. Um, I pray, Father, that you will just speak through my husband and minister to those here and around the world. We love you and we lift up this time to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. Welcome, everyone. Today's... Pentecost Service 2000 um, Worldwide Event. I'm excited for today. I'm super fired up uh, because this message today, I believe, is going to really impact you know my family. It's going to impact the people that are listening and watching online, and personally, it's going to impact people all around the world. And like Jamie said, our our Save Our Children Ministry started about six years ago. We started learning this message and started honoring the things that you're going to see today about ten years ago. Lord came to us and really started sharing with us uh, the truth about the Bible and, and His covenant and how it all works. And so today, I believe it's going to be a special day for the entire world. Amen. Let me share why. I believe that the information you're going to hear today um, is probably the first time it's being taught on a worldwide scale like this in 2,000 years. And I know that's a pretty bold thing, but it's true and you'll see why as we go through the, today's message. And so I really pray that you um, stay to the end. I pray that you really um, take heart to the message. I pray that you're engaged and excited to learn what you're about to learn today. We're going to sing a few songs that um, God put on my heart to share because right now the world is crazy. It's actually at a time, like the Bible says in the book of Matthew 24, it says, in the time of the end, it's going to be like a day that has never existed before or afterwards. And right now, some of the things that are happening right now in the world have never, ever happened before. Um, there's never been a worldwide shutdown. There was never ability to do that before because there was no technology to be able to shut everybody down based on the media. There's never been a time where everyone was sheltered in their house and losing their businesses where 40 million people in the United States alone lost their jobs in a month or two months. There's never been a time like that. There's never been a time in the, in the history of mankind where all food production got just shut down pretty much for, for countries um, where, you know, millions and millions of animals were killed and, you know, food production is going to be a shortage over time because of such a thing. It's never been a time like that. It's never been a time where the stock market will fluctuate the way it's been fluctuating. And the transfer of wealth has gone from the poor or the middle class to the wealthy in such a short period of time as of right now. There's never been a time where uh, the Hebrew Israelites or the people in America stood up for <laughs> what they call today Black Lives Matter. Um, I call it Hebrew Lives Matter, but uh, you know, however you want to look at it. People call it Black Lives Matter, and, and there's never been a time where the entire world are looking at these people and you know, trying to stand up for their rights and stand up for you know, equality on that scale. There's never been a time like that. Um, there's never been a time. Where, with the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the floods and the tsunamis and, and all the different things that are happening around the world, the volcanoes and all the different natural disasters 
that are happening right now at the level that they're happening, there's never been a time like that. There's charts out there that show how high off the chart all those have happened. There's never been a time where there's been worldwide fires that have destroyed millions upon millions and millions of acres you know, of, of land and animals. Even in Australia, over 20 million animals have died in, in just because of their fires alone. Well. Never been a time where 90% of all the animals on Earth, including all in the ocean and on land, have died. We have websites that show mass deaths of fish and animals and horses and cows and all kinds of stuff. It's never been a time. And the Bible says in the time of the end before Jesus comes, it's going to be a time like has never existed before and will never exist again. And I believe we're right around that time. So that's why this message today, I believe, is going to be powerful for all of us that are listening to the message. There's also never been a time where the police have been um, as aggressive towards people in this world, especially in the United States. It's never been a time. But I want to share um, a song that God has put on my heart that was sent to me the other day. Because you know, God appoints the governors. He appoints the presidents. He appoints the kings and rulers of this world. He appoints the, the leaders. He appoints the authorities, even the police. And I can tell you right now that all the police aren't bad. All the governors aren't bad. All the, this, the, the congregation, congressmen are not bad. All the, the leaders of this world are not bad. Not all. There's some that have a heart for God. There's some that want to do the right thing. And what you're going to hear right now is a song from one of them. So I've been working on a song. <laughs> I guess all that's irrelevant. I just want to bless you guys with something. Listen. It's me, Lord. And I'm standing in need. I know I don't call you like I used to. But I need you to wrap your Right now this world is going through something nice And it's getting a little too hard to bear We searched all over for the remedy But it looked like we can't find it nowhere And then I remember you said to me You said call on my name Nowhere. Yeah. 
There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won He is risen from the dead And I will rise When He calls my name No more sorrow No more pain I will There's a day that's drawing near When this darkness breaks to light And the shadows disappear And my faith shall be my eyes Jesus has Amen. Are we going to get our hearts prepared for today's lesson? God, you know, that's what we're waiting for. God, for him to come and 
You call our name. That's what we're all waiting for. And I pray that you're all waiting for this. If you have friends and family or loved ones that you believe that this message could be impacting for, this would be a good time to start texting them, emailing them, letting them know about um, our message that we're going to be presenting today. Uh, this will give them time to come on and, and learn the same thing you're going to learn, learn today about the kingdom of God. to fall asleep There was so much on my mind Searching for that peace For the peace I could not find So then I kneeled down to pray Praying, help me please Then he said, you don't have to cry Supply all your needs as soon as I start worrying. As soon as I stop worrying, worrying how the story is. When I let go, I let go and, and I let, let, him let, him go. let him have it. Let him have it. That's when things start happening. That's when things start happening. When I start looking at back when I let go. There's so much going on Sometimes I can't find my way And oftentimes I struggle Struggle from day to day I have to realize that it's not my battle It's not my battle to fight I have to know if I put it in the head
when this ministry started years ago, you know, I was concerned about how it was going to go, whether my family was going to want to listen to it, because that was all I had to talk to at that time. Um, and God's done some amazing things with it since. And that's why this message is for everyone around the world, people that are listening to it online, people that are on Facebook listening to it, people that will listen to the recording of it. This message is for people that really want to be here and really want to honor this message. So it's exciting. I'm encouraged. But I had to let go and let God. That song is what got me through this whole um, this whole 10 years worth of, of, of learning and teaching this message to the world. Um, let's prepare our hearts for the, the glorious day that Jesus is going to come. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed, living he loved me, dying he saved.
that song is perfect because that's exactly right. One day he is going to come. And he's going to come at the sound of the trumpet. So what I'm going to do is have my son come up. His name is Maddox. Come on up, buddy. And he's going to blow the trumpet. Perfectly he'll come right now, but if he chooses not to, I can understand. <laughs> he has a lot more people that need to be saved. But my son is going to blow the trumpet. Come on up real quick. All right, stand right here. And he's going to blow the trumpet. Go ahead. All right, great job. Thank you. He's getting better and better at it. See, I can't blow the trumpet because I got a crooked pucker. <laughs> Years ago, I had a little injury in that. And I can't blow the trumpet like I used to. But I'm excited to be here today. Again, our ministry is Save Our Truth Ministry. And we're going to be talking about the Passover service. This is our website, SaveByTruth.com. And I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint because I'm going to do a part music with a PowerPoint today to make it easier to go through the scriptures. Today we're celebrating Pentecost, and Pentecost is the Feast of the Lord. Uh, if you have a pen and paper, you may want to take some notes and write the scriptures down that I'm going to share. We're going to go through a few scriptures. And then also, uh, these scriptures will be made available to you online, so if you want to download them, you're more than welcome to, uh, because this Bible study is very, very important, and this message is important for the world. And you're going to see why as we go through the scriptures. This is my wife, Jamie, and my daughter, Jaden, and my son, Maddie, that you just saw. That was a few years ago. And then uh, our ministry is Saved by Truth International Ministry. It was established in 2010. That's when we started learning the message, and the actual ministry started about six to seven years ago. So we're going to be talking about Pentecost, the Feast of the Lord. And I believe that this is the greatest love story ever told. Uh, we did a message on that yesterday on the Sabbath day about the greatest love story ever told. But today it's going to be about Pentecost and what the meaning of Pentecost is. Because a lot of people really don't know the meaning of this particular feast. Even though a lot of uh, churches and, and people talk about it, they talk about New, um, New Testament churches and New Testament Christians and stuff like that, they really don't understand the meaning of this particular feast. So that's what we're going to be covering today is what the meaning of this feast is and how it pertains to you directly. So again, this is Saved by Truth. This is our website. You're welcome to go to it. Savedbytruth.com and you can see our website. And this is our ministry. This is some of the people in our ministry. This is uh, Mano. He's out in India. Uh, Mano is in India right now. They actually had their, their service last night. And it was really awesome because they were going from town to town for years and they've been studying the Bible with pastors in India. We, we did a video years ago, and he saw the message, and he took his entire congregation off Sunday evening, started keeping the Sabbath day, and started teaching the message, and he has taught well over 500 pastors in his area. Um, so St. Martin's ministry has spread all over India and, um, through this man, Mano. And then this is another gentleman named Ra and, and Praveen. We did the same thing with them in, in India, in different parts of India. There's three different parts. And when they were over there, they actually met about three to 500 pastors each. So it was about 1,500 pastors total that we started teaching, and they started going town to town. And when you see these guys that they're teaching, it's me teaching them just like I'm doing right now on Zoom, and then they would actually translate the message. They would hear what I said, and they would interpret it into their language and teach the message, and we've led well over you know, 5,000, 10,000 people over there uh, between the pastors and all their congregations over the last few years. And then we fed them, we, you know, some of the donations that were given to us, we were able to feed some of the people over there over the years. Um, and this is some of the messages. You can actually see me on the screen back there, way there in the background. And that was me on the screen, and then they were doing the translation. And it was pretty awesome. 2018 is when all that started. God started going out, finding his sheep, and looking for his people, started teaching them about the covenant. And a lot of the guys in the white shirts there are the actual pastors, and each one of those pastors have their own congregation. So St. Mike's ministry, you may see a few people online, but it's, it's actually a lot bigger than it appears. And God's body of Christ is a lot bigger. You know, there's people all around the world becoming members of God's body. What we used to do is they used to take the message, and they would make copies of it. So that's a copy of our PowerPoint right there, the same one you're looking at right now. And they would take, make copies of it and go spread the message. So we need the funds and donations that were given to our ministry. We would take it, give it to them. We would help feed the kids help pull them for school, and then help them go and spread the message around the world. And so anything that you've given to us, we appreciate because this is where it went, and we should serve and spread the word of God all around the world. And so these are some more uh, pictures of some of the, the women in and, and the different ministries over there in India and in Africa as well, and you'll see that here in a moment. So these are some of the brothers in Africa. Same thing, this is Robert, 
and some of the people over there, there was several brothers in Kenya and in Uganda and now in Nigeria that did the exact same thing. They went and spread the message all over there in Africa and it's spreading to other countries because we actually had a TV show running consistently in Nigeria, actually in Kenya, for, for a couple of months. And it was running the show of my Bible study, of our Bible study on the online, and it ran for months. So I don't know how many people have seen this. Don't know. That's not my job to know. My job is to plant seeds. I don't know which one of those kernels are going to turn into corn. I don't know. That's not my job. That's God's job. So we just did a lot of planting, and they did a lot of planting. And so the same thing happened. These were some of the brothers recently. Uh, this is Robert, and this is uh, Mano, and, and some of his group. Um, just yesterday, I got some messages, some text messages at their Pentecost service. One of the brothers baptized 50 people. Whoa. One of the brothers over there in Kenya baptized 50 people. I just got a message text message last night. Another one baptized 70 people uh, last night. And then we just current came, uh, got another message from another brother over in Pakistan um, who has hundreds of people that are getting baptized. Uh, they've been working on it. And so that's just three pastors. Wow. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of pastors over there that learned this message. We did some Facebook ads and ran this message around the world. And these are some of the recent ones. These are some of the people that we were just talking about right there. Um, they're taking this message around the world. And uh, Daniel uh, actually took our copy of our message and recopied it and redid it in his language with his picture on it. And he's teaching it on Instagram, teaching it on WhatsApp app, teaching it on Facebook, and teaching it in his community in Nigeria. And I know this message is going around the world in Nigeria as well. And so it's amazing what God is doing, what God is doing around the world. And that's just there. We don't know what's happening in the United States. We don't know what's happening in South America. We do know what's going in Australia. We have a lady in Australia that's teaching the message and sharing it over there as well. The United States is a little bit more challenging because people over here don't necessarily want to hear the message as much as they do in other countries. In other countries, they love the Lord. They love the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their spirit. Over here, they love money. Over here, they love fame, and they love recognition, and they love their sports, and they love their business, and they love their, their life. But over there, they don't have a lot. They love the Lord. And so the Lord said, I'm going to go find my sheep all over the world. And that's what he's been doing. And it's been amazing. So these are some of the pastors just in the last couple of days that have heard this message, repented, got their sins forgiven, and when they get baptized, they get baptized with full clothes on in dirty, muddy water. They don't worry about the water. They don't worry about it being perfect. They're going to make it happen. They get it done. And it's so amazing what the Lord is doing um, through Save by Church Ministry by um, one man, which was myself and my wife and my family, deciding to go against the grain. You know, about 10 years ago when God shared this message with us, uh, we were going to a Sunday keeping church as well, and God said, Stephen, um, to, to Jamie, my wife, about the Sabbath, they started talking about the Sabbath and the commandments, saying, we need to learn about the Sabbath day, this kind of commandments. So we're like, what the heck does that mean? So we studied it out. We started understanding about, about the scriptures. And God just opened up the floodgates to us. He started teaching us about the word of God in a way that we had never heard before. And we could not um, understand why he was teaching us in such an in-depth manner. But now we understand. And that's what we're going to be sharing with you today, is what the Lord is doing. Because he shared with us his feast days and the meaning of his feast days. So we're going to talk about Pentecost today because this is a feast day which is in, next in line. Kind of like, you know, on the Gregorian calendar, you have different you know, holidays that come throughout you. You have New Year's, and you have what, what comes that day? Valentine's Day. Then they have, like, St. Patrick's Day. Then they have Fourth uh, of July and then Easter, and then they have, um, I, I don't know, Lent or something. There are all these different Halloween and Christmas. you got all these different holidays that are nowhere found in the Bible, by the way. They're all pagan. If you do the study on the Royal Pega, and we used to honor them too, because we didn't know any different. Halloween is the most demonic um, feast there is, but people used to honor it, and we used to as well, because we didn't know any different. But then God showed us in the Bible his feast days. And that song we just read about Jesus coming, he said he, um, he, he died and he was buried and, and washed the sins away and all that type of stuff. Well, what people don't know is that those were feast days. And we're going to talk about those feast days in a moment, because it's important to understand, but this is the next feast day. In order. And that's why today is so important because this was a major feast day that the Lord put in place and he said he was going to fulfill. Remember Matthew 5? He said, I didn't come to abolish the law or the commandments. I came to fulfill it. 
And this is how he's fulfilling. He's fulfilling them through us over time. And he fulfilled it through the disciples the first time he came, and he's fulfilling these through us. And you're going to see that as we go through the message today. So we're going to be talking about the covenants of the Lord. The Lord's covenants. So let's talk about the first thing, is the Lord's annual feast days. One of, we're going to break some myths today. We're going to be breaking a lot of myths today, because one of the myths is that the Lord's feast days are Jewish feasts. I want to break that right up front. First of all, when Egypt, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, there were no Jews. They came out of Egypt. No, there was no tribe of Jews. If you understand the word Jews, it is a name of a group of people. It was a made-up name, kind of like the word Christian. There's no Biblically, they were disciples. Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them. And then they were called Christians in Antioch. They were called, it was a nickname. Just like today, you can go talk to a thousand people and ask them, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I do. Are you a Christian? Uh, yeah, I guess I am. But that doesn't mean they're a disciple. A disciple is actually a follower. We're going to talk about that today, too. There's, some, there's a big difference between a person who says they believe in Jesus and a person actually following him. Dramatic difference. Just like there's a big difference between a true Israelite person who's a disciple of Jesus and is like, then there is a person who's a call of those Jews. So we'll talk about that a little later. But So these are the Lord's appointed feasts. And in the, in the Bible, the Lord, before he became flesh, was the same Lord. He was just God, and, and, and now we call him Jesus because he became flesh and became Emmanuel, and we call him Jesus based on the scriptures. So these are the Lord's appointed festivals. And that's the first thing you got to grasp. With this message, these are not Jewish festivals, these are not Christian festivals, these are not God's festivals, these are the Lord's festivals. And they're appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. When I think of the word sacred, that means something important, something that we acknowledge, something we put our heart behind, something that's a commitment to it, something that we honor. It's sacred. You know, like, when someone dies, what do you do? You get, like, a, a shrine sometimes. You put the ashes in it. You sit up. Because it's sacred to you, right? It's important. And you don't want to drop that. You don't want to mess it up, right? It's important to you. It's sacred. Well, the Lord is sacred to me. And the Lord wants us to be sacred to you. And he wants these, these assemblies, which is what we're doing today, assembling, to be sacred to you. So if your heart right now is not 100% here, I hope it gets here. And I hope you have texted some of your friends and some of your family members, some of your loved ones, and invited them to our, our ministry today to hear this message. Because the Lord is about to speak to you in a way that you've never been spoken to in the last 2,000 years. And I know that's a pretty bold statement. But you're going to see why I say that by the time we're done. This message, I'm going to say it one more time so it's crystal clear. The message you're about to hear today has never been spoken in about 2,000 years from the time Peter preached it years ago. And I know that's a really bold statement, but you'll know why by the time we're done. So we're talking about the Lord's feast day. I'm just going to cover them briefly. Passover was the day Jesus died on the cross. He died on Passover. He was our Passover lamb. That's why we don't celebrate an Easter or bunny. He was our Passover lamb. And then he was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was buried on that day. They couldn't let the bread rise, so yeast means unleavened is, is sin. He got the sin out of our life. That's what his baptism was when he was in the grave. And then first fruit is when he rose from the dead. He was the first to rise among many brothers. He was the first to rise from the dead. And that was the, on the Feast of First Fruit. So he was buried. He um, died, buried, and was resurrected on those three feast days. The next feast, he walked around to the brothers for, uh, and, and showed himself to over 500 people. And then he went to the top of the mountain. Remember, they right at the top of the mountain, he gave them a commandment, which we're going to talk about in a minute. He told them what to do. And then he ascended to heaven and sent down his Holy Spirit. And when he sent down his Holy Spirit, that feast was called Pentecost. And it's ironic that that feast day was the exact same day that Moses went to the top of the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. It was the exact same day, 2,000 years later. So Moses did it the first time, Jesus did it the second time. So those feasts were fulfilled by the Lord. The rest of the three feasts we're not going to talk about today. But the other three feasts are being fulfilled by the Lord as well. We're going to talk about Pentecost, because that's the feast that we're here for today. 
So the, the, the real question you got to ask yourself is, is it important from this point on, now that you know God's feast, is it important to honor God's feast, or should you keep honoring those pagan feasts that are not anywhere in the Bible? As a matter of fact, God says, don't cut down the tree. Adorn it with gold and silver and, and fasten it to wood. Don't do that. Because those are the ways of the nation. That's what it says in, in Joel. Just, you shouldn't do that. Actually, it's in Jeremiah 10. You understand? It says don't do that. So should you be honoring those, or should you be honoring the Lord? You should be honoring the Lord. So let's look. Because a lot of people will say, well, well, yeah, but see, those were for the, the Israelites back in the day. Well, let's see what the Bible says. Galatians 3, verse 26, it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor there is there male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. So the big thing they understand right now is because Jesus came, he gave everyone the opportunity to become one of Abraham's seed. And the way you become Abraham's seed is you are baptized into Christ. If you're alive today, when you're baptized into Christ, into the, into the, baptized in the water for the forgiveness of your sin, to receive the Holy Spirit, you're one of Abraham's seeds. In addition to the people that died years ago. So that's how you become Abraham's seed. So there's no more difference. So if to say that the feast days are the Jews or the Old Testament or anything, that's that's false teaching. And you're going to see why in a minute. That's false teaching. But understand this, those feast days are for you. Those feast days are for all of you watching today. So this message that we're going through today is how to lead Lord, the Lord's people to the kingdom of God. That's the goal of this message. The goal of this message. This, this, I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. That there's an intent for this message, an intent. And the intent is to help people become the chosen people. Because God says there are chosen people, a holy priesthood. You know, there's a, there's a holy nation, there's a nation of people, and those are Abraham's seed. And, and he says they're chosen. And so the goal of this message is to make chosen people around the world. It's also to make the elect. The Bible talks about in the last days there's going to be an elect group of people. As a matter of fact, he said the time will be cut short for the sake of the elect, or no flesh will be saved. It says that in Matthew 24. So, you got to understand, this message is to help people become the elect. It's also for the church of Philadelphia. The book of Revelation, we'll talk about later, that there's a church called the church of Philadelphia, and that is the only of the seven churches that do not go through the hour of trial, which is coming on the whole world right now. It's being implemented right now. That's why we're stuck in our home. That's why the mark of the beast is being implemented right now is because of the, the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. This message is to help produce the rest of the 144,000. Not only the dead in Christ, the ones that are already dead, but it's the ones that are alive and remain. They get caught up to go meet the Lord in the air when he comes soon. So that's the intent of this message. It's also to help people so they do not go through the hour of trial that is going to come on which is the great tribulation. If you're not part of that first group, group, this group right here, you will go through the hour of trial. And it is not going to be good. You think it's bad now. This is nothing compared to what it's going to be. Very simple. So, if you understand what I'm about to share with you, and take this message serious, I recommend not to be doing something else right now. I recommend you not be having this open and watching something else and, and you know thinking about business and thinking about other stuff in life and, and you know just carrying on. I recommend you make this the most important time in your life. Because this could be the most important message of your life. It could be. So we're gonna talk about the new covenant. We're gonna talk about um, what we people call the old covenant, and we're gonna talk about those. From this message. But before we do, we got to set a foundation. Because some of you watching this message don't understand the importance of the Bible. People sometimes think that the Bible is written by man. Sometimes people think it, you know, there's mistakes in the Bible. And, and there are things that people are added and taken away, which the Bible does predict. It's going to happen. The Bible says that people are going to add and subtract from the Bible. And they're just going to get the plagues of the Bible. But there's some foundational principles that you got to understand. 
if you want to be considered one of those 144,000. And this is one of them. It says, verse 16, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. By the way, I write it down these scriptures, and then look at them in your own Bible after this message as well, because you want to know these scriptures for yourself. It says, all scripture is God breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the big thing that you want to see here is that all scriptures God read, not the New Testament, not just the Old Testament, not the what people call the Torah, which there's no word Torah in the Bible. It, it's all scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, all scripture is God read. And it's useful. In other words, it needs to be used. You know, car tires and brakes are only useful when used. If you don't have them on your car, if you don't even have them on your car, if you never drive your car, guess what? They're, they're useless. See, but brakes on your car are essential to stop the car from crashing. And the same thing with the Bible. The Bible is essential if you want to be thoroughly equipped. So if you don't use the Bible, then it's useless. You know what I'm saying? If you don't read the scripture, it's useless in your life. And so it says that it's useful. And it's useful for several things. One, for teaching. And today we're going to be doing some teaching. This message is to teach you the truth. Because the Bible says that Jesus came and he wants all men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. Two things. Not just to be saved, but to come to the knowledge of the truth. That means there must be a bunch of deception. And if there was that much deception when it was written, how much deception do you think there is now? A lot more. There's 47,000 different denominations of Christianity, but one Bible. That don't make any sense to me at all. There's not 47 different, different ways to do math. There's not 47,000 different ways to be a brain surgeon. There's not 47,000 different to be a Muslim. There's not 47,000 of Buddhists. How come there's 47,000 different Christianity? You know why? Because Satan knows this is the right message, and he wants to confuse you, even the elect, if that were possible. That's why. So we're going to be teaching in this message. You're also going to be rebuking. This the Bible is good for rebuking. You're going to have some rebukes today. Rebuking means a strong correction. Like if my son goes and, and does something, let's say he's going to test the stove, and I say, don't test the stove because it can burn you. And then of course, what kids do? They go back to test the stove anyway because they don't listen. So I slap the hand and say, hey, don't test the stove. That's called a rebuking. It's a strong correction. The Bible is going to give some strong correction today to some of you. Some of you listen to this message because there's been some deception that's in your life that you may not realize. And the Bible is going to help correct that. Yeah. You're going to spank him today. It's also good for correcting. In other words, if you're off track a little bit. See, if you have a, a train and it's going down the track at 70 miles an hour, and that track down the road, a mile down the road, is an inch off, guess what ends up happening to that train? It derails and everyone on it dies or gets hurt really bad. See, so you need to make sure it's correct. And guess what? The Bible says it's a narrow road, and most don't find it. Narrow. It says narrow. It, it says the wide is the road that leads to destruction, and, and many fall through it. And narrow is the road that leads to life, and very few find it. Very few. When I think of the word few, I look at Noah's day. Because that's the example he likes to give. You know, Noah says few too. It says few in all were on, on that boat. There was only eight people. There were millions on earth, but only eight on the boat. And people will say, this is, this is a deception. Believers and, and pastors and stuff will say, oh, well, God loves everyone. He loves everyone in the world, and he will let everyone be saved. Well, he didn't know his day. He killed everyone but eight people. So why would he do it again? He will. If you think about it, the Israelites were going into the promised land. They were supposed to be going to the promised land. Two million people came in and came out of Egypt. Came out of Egypt that were enslaved. Two million, or more than two million, crossed the Red Sea. But guess how many went into the Promised Land of those two million? Two. That sounds like few. So when you hear the number 144,000 versus 7.5 billion, that sounds like few to me. So don't, don't get it twisted. Don't think that um, Jesus is just going to let everybody be saved just because you believe in him or you got dunked in water at one point. Don't believe, don't think that. So the Bible is going to be doing some correcting today. The Bible is also going to be some training in righteousness. And when I think about training, you know, I go to the gym, I start working out again, I start to get a little bit of belly. 
So I needed to start getting back some exercise. I got some video tapes. I do some exercise. So I need to start doing some training. But it would be foolish for me to think I'm going to get down there and do some exercise one day, and then all this does is it'll be gone. It don't work that way. You know what I got to do? I got to do it four or five days a week consistently. I got to do it consistently. I got to put the effort in consistently. I got to put extra effort. I got to burn a sweat. I got to go up and run stairs and go to the park. And, and I got to do some stuff. It ain't just, I just do a little bit of something and think I'm, I'm, I'm in shape now all of a sudden. That's called deception. And I think there's a lot of people right now that are deceived, thinking because they got dunked in water and baptized. I'm just using them because everyone else really are deceived in a big way. But I'm talking about the people that are believers. I'm not even talking about anomaly today. Because anomaly, and I hope you hear this message and repent. This message are to the believers. Because when the, when the Feast of Pentecost, when Peter was out there teaching, he was talking to the people that were believers. No one was at the Feast of Pentecost, really, pretty much, if they weren't a believer in God at some level, or they wouldn't have been there. They were at a feast day. You understand? So he wasn't talking to a bunch of non-believers. They just didn't understand who Jesus was. They believed in God. That's why they were there honoring the feast. And so today's message is to you, to you, to you, to you, to you, all of you, to the believers. It's not to the non-believers. So this Bible is going to be doing some training in righteousness, because if you, you want to be righteous, the Bible has to do the training, and it says, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped. Because I can tell you right now, if you're not using the word of God, then you can't possibly be thoroughly equipped. That means you're ill-equipped for the kingdom of God. So this is a very important scripture that is a foundation that you need to understand. Here's another foundation of principle. It says 2 Peter 2 I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came by by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this is the foundational principle you've got to get, that above all, above anything you've been taught, above anything you believe, above anything your pastor may have shared with you, or anything you've conjured up in your own head, it says above anything else, you must believe what the Bible just said next, which is that not a single word in this Bible came by the person who wrote it. So don't say, well, Paul says this, and this is the writing of Moses, and such as, no, no, no. None of them wrote a single word of the Bible. 100% every word in that book was written by the Word of God. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The man that wrote it didn't write a single word. So that's a foundation of principle, and that's why you put your faith in God, in God and in the Word of God. You can put your faith in, you put your faith in that because you know that's written by God. If it's written by man, I don't want to hear nothing about it. I don't want to talk about it. If it's written by God, I can, I'll buy that. And you should too. So these are basic foundational principles that we got to start with. Because if we don't start there, there's going to be a lot of deception. That's why there's 47,000 different denominations of Christianity and different churches and congregations. Because they don't hold to these scriptures. They make up their own doctrine. The Bible isn't the final answer. And I'm going to tell you right now, today the Bible needs to be the final answer. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's look at another part of the body of Christ, because this is important. There's also you need to understand who the body of Christ is. It says, consequently, by the way, this is Ephesians 2, verse 19 through 22. It says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Now this is a very important to understand. Because there's a foundation that needs to be laid before we go into the Bible study. We're just getting started. We're just getting warmed up. So there's a foundation that needs to be laid. If you're going to build a skyscraper, you got to lay a foundation. And before they lay the foundation, they got to get a cornerstone. they got to dig a hole and get all the dirt out. But they got to lay a cornerstone. The cornerstone is the first brick. That's laid. So when you have that cornerstone, that first brick is laid, then that's the brick that you build the rest of the house on. If the brick is crooked, guess what the house is? It's called the Leaning Tower of Pizza. That's what happened. They, the, the first brick was laid off. So the whole building was take, was off. And that's why most of these churches and congregations and pastors out there teaching false doctrine because the foundation is off. You understand? If the Bible is not the foundation, then what's the foundation? You understand? You can't put your faith in the Word of God 100%. If it's only 90%, then the foundation's off. It only needs to be one inch off the track of, of the train, right? It needs to be one inch off. You get it? 
So it's so important that the foundation needs to be laid. And the foundation is built on something very important. It's built on the apostles. The apostles are people that walked around with Christ. If you believe in Jesus and you have a person in your, in your congregation and they call themselves an apostle, they're deceived. And let me tell you why. Because apostles walked with Jesus. If you didn't walk alive physically with Jesus, then you can't be an apostle. There's no more apostles being created. Because it's not here right now. Maybe when he comes back, when we walk with him, maybe we'll be called apostles. I don't know. But right now, there's no apostles. So, since that's the case, that's the first part of the group. The second one are the prophets. The prophets are the people in the scriptures from old. You know, Moses and Noah and all those. They were called prophets. They were telling the future what's going to happen in the future. So, you got the, the foundation of the, of, the, um, of the body of Christ have apostles in it, have prophets in it, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus. Here's the question. Where's the only place on earth you can find all three, the apostles, the prophets, and the chief cornerstone. There's only one place. In the Bible. The 66 books of the Bible. That's the reason why I put my faith in God's work. Because it is Jesus. That is the Lord. He said, I became flesh. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It says, in him, verse 21, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. How does the spirit get in you? Through baptism. We're going to look at that in a little bit. So that's who we're talking to. So if you've been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you're part of that body right now. The question is, are you going to remain part of the body? That's the real question. Because just because you're part of the body don't mean you can't get kicked out the body. Trust me on that. There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. That's false doctrine. And we're going to be exposing some of that false doctrine today. So you got to understand, just because you were baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, you got part of the body, don't mean you can't get kicked flat out the body. Because the Bible is clear on that people will get kicked out of the body. Very quickly. If they don't repent. Let's look. First Peter. Look what it says. It's built. Actually, I just looked at that scripture. So what we're going to look at now is Matthew 28. Matthew 28 is the start of the Feast of Pentecost. It's right after Jesus died, was buried, was resurrected. He arose. The people that called themselves Jews and the, and the Romans came up with a lie saying that he didn't die and he didn't raise from the dead. And so that was, you can read that in, in uh, Matthew 28, verses. 10, around there, when he gets to 28, Jesus came and he appeared to all the disciples. And he was just about to ascend to heaven. These were the last words that he said to the disciples before he ascended. He said, Matthew 28, verse 20, 18 through 20, he said, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That was the command God gave to his disciples, the people that were following him. This was the last words he said to them. He said three things. One, go make a disciple of all nations. What that means is a person who's actually going to follow him. We're going to talk about what a disciple is today. We're going to look at the scriptures and see what the Bible says the disciple is. You notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say go make Christians of all nations. I don't consider myself a Christian. I'm absolutely a disciple of Jesus. I follow actually the word of God and follow what he says, no matter where he goes, no matter where he wants to take me. There's a big difference between a person who calls himself a Christian and a disciple. So we're going to look at the meaning of that. Then it says, go baptize them. It says, baptize disciples. Matter of fact, most Christians don't even believe in baptism. They say it's an outward sign of inward grace, which is a flat lie. There's no scripture that says it's an outward sign of inward grace. Man-made doctrine. So, it doesn't say go make Christians. And then it says, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. We're going to talk about what he told them to command, to obey. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about that today. So what must it take to be a disciple? It says, number one, you must hold to his teaching. You must hold to Jesus' teaching. Is the first thing he talks about. We're going to look at John 8, verse 31 and 32. 
It says, to the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So notice he says three things. Number one, you got to hold to Jesus' teaching. Hold him to his teaching. What does that mean, hold to his teaching? Well, if you're, if, if you're on the edge of a cliff, and you know you, you slipped, and your hands are there, and the only thing holding you up is that if holding on, what are you going to do? Are you going to hold tight, or are you going to hold loosely? You're going to hold tight, right? Right. You're going to hold tight. You're going to have a firm grip, because if you let go, you're dead, right? Well, the same thing. If you don't hold on to Jesus' teaching, you're going to be dead in the same way. It says the disciple holds on to Jesus' teaching. He says if, and that's optional. See, if you don't hold on to Jesus' teaching, then you're not really Jesus' disciple. No matter what you call yourself. See, if you hold on to somebody else's teaching, then you're somebody else's disciple. It's easy to see Jesus as a disciple. Because when the Bible says something, they say amen. They humble themselves, they repent, and they honor. It's easy to see Jesus as a disciple. It says, then you're going to learn the truth, and then the truth is going to set you free. So we talked about the truth again. See, you notice he's going back to that truth? Because there's a lot of deception in the world. That anybody can just be a disciple and you're good. Well, it doesn't work that way, my friend. Let's look. The only place you can find Jesus' teaching is in those 66 books in the Bible. So that's why you got to hold to the scriptures. you got to honor the scriptures. you got to read the scriptures. And most importantly, you got to obey what they say. you got to obey it. You can't just read it and then put it on the shelf. You have to actually live the scriptures. Let's read. Here's the one thing you got to understand is that whoever is teaching you as you hold on to is whoever is disciple you are. So I'll give an example. If, if your church teaches you something that's different than what the Bible says, then whose disciple are you? You're your church's teaching. Disciple. If your pastor says something that's different than what the scripture says, let's say your pastor says something like this. All you got to do is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because that's a, a popular doctrine out there. All you do is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're saved. Now, there's nowhere in Scripture that says that, and nobody in the Scripture has ever done that. But if your pastor teaches that and the Bible shows you something different, who are you going to follow and who are you going to believe? See, if you believe your pastor, then you're, you're really your pastor's disciple. If your minister or your Bible talking leader tells you something that's different than what the Bible teaches, then you're their disciple. If the Pope teaches you something, like you can sprinkle a baby on the head, and that's baptism. Or the, the fourth commandment is on Sunday, if they teach you that. Or if they teach you some other you know, doctrine, and you follow that, and the Bible says something different, then you're really their disciple. You're either deceived or you're their disciple. Now, if your parent, let's say your parents, your mom or dad teaches you something that's different than what the Bible says. If you love them more than you love the, the Lord, then you're really their disciple. Or maybe you, you follow the internet. You're, you're in the Bible study group on Google. Or YouTube. You're in the YouTube Bible study world. Right? And that's who you follow someone from there because they said something that's impacting. And maybe you watch videos or something else. Or, or more importantly, maybe you, you find your own beliefs. And you want to do things your way. You think your way is the right way to do it. Now you don't actually read or obey the Bible at all. You just follow your own decisions, your own beliefs, your own convictions. No matter what the Bible says, you're going to do it your way because you know best. Then you're not your own disciple. You ain't Jesus' disciple. No matter what you call yourself, and this is very, very important to understand, no matter what you call yourself, I can call myself a brain surgeon right now. I can say, you guys know what? I'm a brain surgeon. And as a matter of fact, I am such a good brain surgeon. I'm one of the best, I'm one of the top brain surgeons on earth. As a matter of fact, I believe that beyond the shadow of a doubt. As a matter of fact, I go hang out with brain surgeons. I live with brain surgeons. I wear brain surgeon outfits. I go study brain surgery books every once in a while. I watch brain surgery videos consistently. I watch ER on TV every week. I got it recorded, so I'm watching it on loop. Let me ask you a question. Would you let me do brain surgery right now? No. See, because that, just because I believe I'm a brain surgeon, don't make me a brain surgeon. And just because you may act like you're a disciple, don't make you a disciple. You understand? It's so important. Just because you call yourself a disciple, don't make you a disciple. It's easy to see a, a disciple. You know why? Because a brain surgeon will actually go do brain surgery. See, that's the difference. Brain surgeries do brain surgery. 
They healed people. They got people out of their, their misery. They cured them. They live brain surgery. They don't just talk brain surgery. And guess what true disciples do? They are brain, they, they talk discipleship. They live like a disciple. In and out of, of the public eye. See, I learned a sentence years ago when I was young. It said, who you are when you're alone is who you really are. It doesn't matter who you are in front of me, because I'm nobody. It's not, it doesn't matter who you are in front of the public or in front of the world. It's who you are when you're alone. That's what God's looking at. Who are you when you're in your room by yourself? When you're up in the, in, in, at your work by yourself? When you're at school by yourself? When you're at your job by yourself? When, when you're around the public? Who are you then? That's what God looks at. Not who you are in front of the church. They, he knows people front and act like they got it going on and, and try to sing uh, kumbaya. He knows. He says, your hearts are far from me. That's what he says. He, he, he looks at that. And guess what? When, when it's time when he comes, when that trumpet sounds, he's going to look at you and say, I don't know you. Away from me, you people do Because people are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy your name? Didn't I go to church every week? Didn't I honor the Sabbath? Didn't I, didn't I study the Bible with someone once? Didn't I do that? He goes, I don't know you. I don't know you. That's what he's going to say. And then you will go through the great tribulation. That's the understanding you got to understand. Jesus looked for people that are honoring him, not people just talk about him. See, the only place you can find Jesus' teaching is in the Bible. That's why we recommend you honor the scriptures. So the question is, whose teaching are you following? Right to answer that now. Right to answer that question now. Whose teacher am I following? Am I following my own beliefs? Or am I truly following the Lord? So you got to be real with yourself, because most of the time we deceive ourselves over of other people. So you can deceive me all you want. You can deceive your parents all you want. You can deceive your friends all you want. You can deceive the Bible talk leaders all you want. But you can't deceive God. You can't mock him. He knows. He sees everything. Everything is laid back. <laughs> you got to understand. So whose teaching are you following? This is an important message because God wants you to follow him. He's appealing to you right now, just like Peter did 2,000 years ago. Let's look and see what it looks like to be a disciple again. It says, you must hold on to Jesus' teaching. Luke 14, verse 25, it says, large crowds will follow Jesus and turn into them, he said. By the way, I'm going to stop really quick right there. See, a lot of people have this misconception about Jesus, thinking he's just all loving. Well, the pastors today, like these guys that will go and teach the Harvest Crusade, huh? Great glory, or these guys that teach these big churches, congregations, right? They got thousands of people in front of them. What do they want to do? They want to be loved by everyone. God loves you. Just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you'll be saved and get the Holy Spirit. They just want everybody to incorporate everyone, right? That's the whole thing. One unity for everyone, right? Well, Jesus had a lot of crowds with them, too. Jesus used to have large crowds, and if Jesus was that all loving God, then he should have said something similar. Just say, oh, just love me. He could have said that, right? But let's see what Jesus really said. He said, verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brother, his sister, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry the cross and follow me can't even be considered a disciple. So let me explain what that means in, in layman's term. It means if you don't hate, in other words, Love the Lord so much more than your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, even your own life, you can't even be considered a disciple by Jesus. You might call yourself one, but Jesus is not going to call you one. And that's what's important. You understand? So if your life, if how you live, if what you do is more important than Jesus and living for him, then guess what? You're, he won't even consider you a disciple. And this is one of those rebukes you got to really realize. Look at your life. What's the most important? Is your life important? Most important? And taking care of your family and taking care of your kids and, and having your business and having your success in life and having this career. Is that most important? Or is doing everything you can for the Lord who will be with him most important? This is a reality check, you guys. This is what Peter preached back then. See, because if not, you can't even be considered a disciple. 
So you got to ask yourself, where am I? These will be notes for you to take. You should be writing down these notes and, and really doing a heart check right now. The Bible says examine yourself to see if you are right with the Lord. I'm just sharing the message, you guys. I'm just the messenger. This is not my words. I didn't write these words. These are the scriptures. I'm just kind of pointing them out for you. Leading you because I care. I want you to make it. Because if you understand, the Bible says people are going to wish they could die and won't be able to during the great tribulation. That's what it says. In other words, people are going to be begging for a flood of Noah, but there won't be one. You don't want to go through that. You want to repent, so you need to really reflect on your life. Let's read. Because you've got to really understand the meaning of the scripture. It says, Matthew 10, verse 37 and 38, it says, If anyone, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Any, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds the life will lose it, and whoever loses the life for my sake will find it. That's what he actually means by, you got to love him more than everything else, or you can't even be considered a disciple. So ask yourself, how am I doing on that? How am I doing that? Do I love the Lord more than everything in my life? Not just anything. Everything. Ask yourself that question. Because that's a heart check. Because that's why it's such a narrow road. You know, it's a narrow road and most won't find it. You know why? Because of this. Because they love the Lord. The Lord. You know what's funny? Because I, I study the Bible with a lot of people in the United States. I study the Bible with people overseas. But it's a dramatic difference. Because the brothers overseas, when I show them the scriptures, you know what they say? Wow, that's awesome. And they repent immediately, and they start honoring what it says. And then they go teach it and spread the love. And they have no money. They have no nothing. They have no careers. All, they have nothing to do but to honor the Lord. They don't have nothing. But over here in the United States, God has blessed the United States with so much. And they have all these jobs and comfy living and the life, nice lifestyle and sunshine all the time. And guess what? They can care less about the Lord. They like the Lord. <laughs> they like him. Well, they don't love the Lord. It's a big difference. So you got to ask yourself, do you love the Lord? Or do you just kind of like the Lord? Very important. So the question is, have you made a decision now to become a disciple? Because that decision can be made now. And that's what the Lord wants you to do. He wants you to make the decision to, you know, from this point on, I am a disciple. I'm going to be a disciple. That's it. Because that's the first thing Jesus said. He said, go make disciples. So my appeal today is, is to help you make the decision, that's it. I'm dying to everything. I'm going to be a disciple from this point on. As a matter of fact, my wife and I, years ago, about 10 years ago, um, we actually had this deed of trust. We wrote up this deed of trust piece of paper. You can find one online. It's called a spiritual deed of trust. Um, I forgot the name of the group. Crown Financial. They had this thing called deed, deed of trust. What we did was we wrote out a deed, like a house deed, and what we did was we basically put our entire life on that deed. We put our children on that deed. We put our family our life, our dreams, our goals, our business, our money, our everything on that deed. And we pushed our chips in and said, here, God, this is all for you. Everything is yours. Nothing is mine. You give me what you want me to have. And when we did that, the Lord did something amazing. The Lord did something amazing. He basically gave it all back and then some. He gave us a rich life. And has protected our family in a, in a way I can't even explain. So do you want to be a disciple of Jesus? So if that's the case, we need to repent from our sins. We need to repent. And we're going to look at some of the sins that we need to repent of. Because if you want to be a disciple, the Bible says you need to repent. You need to stop sinning. Let's look at what sin is. Galatians 5.19, it says, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you can add all kinds of different things to that. Immorality, immorality that's the sex, sex before marriage. If that's how you're living, I can guarantee you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. It says impurity. That would be online pornography. That would be all kinds of different things. If you're looking at those types of things, and that's how you live, the Lord knows, even if I don't, if that's how you live, in your heart, if you're lusting after girls and women online or in person, if that's the case, you just chalk it up. You're not going to make it to the kingdom of God unless you repent. It ain't going to happen. 
No matter how much you can deceive the person in front of you, it ain't going to happen. That's the bottom line. He says, I warn you. This is a warning. The Lord is warning you. If you live like this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Period. Don't deceive yourself. Look at some more sense. Ephesians 5, verse 1, it says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the ways of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual morality, or any kind of impurity, or of greed, because of these these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. This is the list I want to second on right now. Because the first thing he talks about is that you notice who he's talking to. He's not talking to non-believers. He's talking to the believers. He's talking to the disciples. Pentecost is about disciples. It's not about or believers that want to follow Jesus. So if this is who you are, it says, one, no sexual morality, not even a hint. Let me tell you what a hint is. Like you're leaning towards it. It's tempting you. You're going after it. It's in your heart you want to do it. That's what a hint is. Or you're playing around with it a little bit. Or impurity. That's lust. Lust of the eyes, lust of the heart. If that's the case, it shouldn't even be a hint. And I think of a hint like my wife makes some chicken right now, and you got to put like a little heap of salt on it, because if you put too much salt, it's over salty. You know, you don't want that. So you got to put a hint, like this little, little pinch, right? It says you can't even have that much of it. It says, because this is improper for God's holy people. But look at what it says next. No obscenity, that means cursing, and talking bad language, foul language. It says foolish talk. You know what foolish talk is? Talking bad about people. Talking smack about people. Talking, you know, in, in a disrespectful way towards people. Or coarse joking. You know what coarse joking is? You know, um, same type of thing, you know, talking bad about people, trying to make them feel bad and stuff like that. It says none of those should be there. Those are out of place. That's why we don't want that in our household. That's not something we want to live. It's not a lifestyle we're going to let allow in our home. That's why we don't allow that in the body of Christ. Our goal is to uplift each other. We should be thanksgiving. Having thankfulness, having a joyful heart, having a loving heart towards one another. But here's why. It says, for this you can be sure. And whenever God says a sentence like that, I get kind of nervous sometimes. Because he, he says, for this you can be sure. In other words, don't, don't deceive yourself thinking something different. For this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as that idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you. So if you're messing around with online stuff, online pornography, or any, any bad stuff online, any, any of that type of stuff, if you're messing around with any of that stuff, I can tell you right now, let no one deceive you. Don't even deceive yourself thinking you're going to be a disciple and you're going to make it to the kingdom of God. If not, you're going to go through the great tribulation. It says, here's why. Don't let, me, let no one deceive you with empty words because of such things God's wrath comes to those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not partner with if there's people in our, in our ministry that are living like that and we find out, guess what? The Bible says do not partner with them. They gotta go. That's just the way it is. And now we don't even have to even usually get rid of them. What ends up happening, they leave. Automatically. Because their life, they're refusing to repent. They're so guilted out because light doesn't want to be with dark, I and mean, darkness doesn't want to be with light. And they end up leaving. This is what happens. So this is very important to understand. That this is what's going to happen. And if you're living that way, God wants you to repent right now. This message is for all of us that are watching this. This is for the body of Christ. This is not for the non-believers. Because Jesus is coming to get his people. And he's purifying us. He wants to see who really wants to be a disciple. And this is what it takes. So the question is, have you made a decision to repent? See, because repentance is a decision. If I'm smoking, I made a decision to stop smoking. Now, if I stop smoking, if I am smoking, is it still going to hurt? Yes. Am I going to get pains? Yes. Am I going to get withdrawals? Yes. But am I willing to endure it? Yes. So that's what it means to repent. It doesn't mean that automatically, you know, all the bad stuff stops happening. No. What you do is you made a decision to stop. And change starts to happen. 
change will be apparent in your life. If you have real repentance, it'll be easy to see. If you don't, it'll be easy to see. Easy to see. We can easily see who really is a disciple and who's repentant, and who's acting and playing the game of a disciple and who has It's easy to see. And God can see it too. And God is very apparent what to do with those people. It says, do not partner with them. It says, do not partner with them. Don't even have anything to do with them. Because the kingdom of God, the, God's wrath is for those people. He's not talking about nominalism. He's talking about disciples. you got to understand. This is so important. God wants you to hear this message. Because this is what Peter preached. And that's he had many words to say. Let's keep reading. So after that, you not only have to make a decision to be a disciple, you have to not only make a decision to get your sins forgiven, which is the next step, you've got to be baptized. Let's read Acts 2.36. It says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, Peter, and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Now, this is a message that a lot of pastors out there, this is a big deception in the world, that a lot of pastors have been teaching, is that you can just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and that's how you get the Holy Spirit. Or you can just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, and that's how you get the Holy Spirit. Or you can just say the sinner's prayer, which there's no words for sure, and then all of a sudden you get the Holy Spirit. Or you can just, you know, the Holy Spirit just gets poured out, just by somehow. Just, God just pours it out on wherever he feels like it. Like it happened in Pentecost once. No, it happened one time in Pentecost, because if not, they would have never had the Holy Spirit to be able to, you know, baptize you. It wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. So he did it once. But people think it's still happening today. I got a guy tell me the other day, it's happening right now. It happens today. I beg to differ. Okay, beg to differ. <laughs> you believe whatever you want to believe. But the bottom line it says, what did Peter preach? Because this message, like I said, is the same message that Peter preached 2,000 years ago. In verse 38, Peter pr- replied, repent, turn away from your sins, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the promise. Verse 39 says, the promise is for you, the people that were there at Pentecost back then. It's for their children, the people that were going to come after them. But it was for all who are far off, for all who the Lord God will call, which is all of us today. All of you watching this message right now, that message is for you. That message is for all of us. See, if you notice, it doesn't say, save the sinner's prayer. And that's a promise for you. It doesn't say, um, confess Jesus in your mouth as, as Lord, and that's a promise for you. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, go accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and that's a promise for you. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, you're saved by grace, and that's a promise. Or you're saved by faith alone, and that's a promise. It doesn't say, you're saved by work. It doesn't say any of that. It says, repent, be baptized. And that's the promise. See, this is why the 67,000 different denominations is because most people don't teach this message. Most people don't teach this message. What they do is they teach some other message. They teach a different message. They teach it about a different Jesus. And that's what's happened. That's why there's so much deception in the world right now. But this is the message Peter preaching, and this is what we're preaching. So let's, let's look, because this is another big deception out there. There's a lot of this multiple baptisms. There's a baptism by the Holy Spirit. This is a baptism by fire. And then there's a baptism in water, and then there's a baptism just by sprinkling on your forehead. But the Bible says something different. The Bible says there's only one baptism. Let's read. Ephesians 4, verse 4. It says, there's one body and one spirit. Here's the question. Is there really only one body? Yes. Is there really only one Holy Spirit? Yes. It says, when you are called to one hope, when you are called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father in all who is over all and through all and in all. One means one. One does not mean two or four. One means one. There's one baptism. And the Bible has to prove what that baptism looks like. Because if, if, if your pastor says, when you say a sinner's prayer, that's a baptism, then that's a lie. Because there's no scripture on that. And there's no one in the Bible that actually have done it. See, this is the deception that came after Peter. Before Peter, Peter didn't preach any of that stuff. Where did he get it from? Where do they get sinner's prayer from? Tell me where you got that from. Who, who, who decides what, what prayer you get to say for the sinner's prayer? Where, where does that come from? That's man-made doctrine. There's no scripture on that. You understand? That's the deception that's happened. That's why this message 
needs to be taught right now because if you're a pastor and you're leading the ministry, say this in this prayer, repent. Because you're teaching false doctrine. There is no such thing as just confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart and you'll be saved. Or you are saved. That's Romans 10 9. But if you read Romans 6, it talks about baptism. It's a deception. It's a deception because Satan doesn't want anyone to be saved. Let's keep reading. So Jesus came for a reason. He came to be our example of how to live, right? He saw us, we were messing up, we couldn't hold all the, all the laws and stuff back then, and he said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them the commandments, and I'm going to have them honor them, and I'm going to hold them to them, and I'm going to teach them exactly how to live. I'm going to teach them. Okay? So this is what he did. Matthew 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came to Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now, it will probably for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God just descending on like a dove and aligning on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, who I love, who I am well pleased. Okay, so Jesus is our perfect example. So Jesus. When he was a baby, was he baptized? No. So there was no sprinkling on the forehead with Jesus. So that means that one just negates that one. That was done. The, the Vatican, he just, I don't know why I did that, but that's all, it's all wrapped up. That's gone. You got that? It's done. There is none of that. So that's, that's deception. When he was a teenager, was he baptized? He used to go to the congregations, to go to the synagogues, go to the churches and listen to the messages, right? He used to go there all the time. What's he saying at that point? Did he have the Holy Spirit at that point? No. So that's deception. That's why there's no teenager or child in there backpack like that. No young teenager. I'm talking about young. 12, 11, 10. We don't see any in the scriptures. When did, did Jesus pray a lot to that? You think he prayed a lot? He prayed a lot. Yeah. Did he did he accept Jesus as Lord? Uh, uh, did he accept God as his as his father? And did, did he say he said a prayer or anything like that? You say? No! You see, all that's deception. But what did Jesus do? He went and got baptized in water for the forgiveness of his sins. Even though he didn't have any sins, he did it to fulfill righteousness, to show us what to do. And so that's baptism. And you're going to see why that's so important for us today. Because that's the deception that's being taught by many pastors all around the world. Let's read John 3, verse 3 through 7. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nick Jesus asked, Surely they cannot enter a second time to, into a mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, You must be born again. See, if you notice, it says water and spirit. It doesn't say water or spirit. Here's another big deception that's out there. And this one's the most, pretty close to the dumbest one I've heard. Oh, well, the water is talking about the water of childbirth. And then you get the Holy Spirit. That's stupid. Every child on earth is born with the water of childbirth. So why would Jesus say water and child or spirit? That makes no sense. He would just have to just say spirit. Because what child is not born of water or childbirth except that one that comes down from fallen angels, maybe? Or, or maybe the, the, the clones, maybe not no water childbirth, but other than that, who, who's born with no water childbirth? <laughs> right? So why would Jesus need to say water and spirit? Does it make sense? That's stupid. Any pastor teaches that it's stupid to hear that. I'm going to be blunt. I have to be blunt. Because, you know, well, I've been preaching this message for 10 years and people don't hear it nicely. So sometimes they got to be blunt. And we got to be blunt about this. It's so important to hear this message. And so you got to understand, that doesn't make any sense. Water of childbirth is mandatory for everybody. This is talking about the water of baptism, and that's why Jesus was baptized in water. And you'll see why in a moment. Let's keep reading. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We were therefore died to sin. How can we live any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. 
See, this is Romans 6, and this is so important. This is what it looks like. Let me show you a, a diagram of what this actually looks like. See, Jesus was on the cross. Our old life, we put on the cross. In other words, we died to ourselves. And then Jesus was buried in the tomb. We're buried in the water of baptism. And Jesus resurrected from the dead on the third day. When we resurrect to a new life, we receive the Holy Spirit and we're born again. Without that, you're still in your sins. If you've been taught by a pastor or by anyone that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you got the Holy Spirit at that point, that's deception and you're still in your sins. You need to repent and go get baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. There's nobody getting the Holy Spirit from a prayer. No one. There's no scripture on that. That's man-made doctrine. This is the promise that Peter preached. And he said it's for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. And so this is how it's done, and this is what you got to believe is what the scripture is showing you here. Baptism also adds you to the body of Christ. It also adds you to the church, God's church. Let's read 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all, not some or most, we are all baptized by one spirit to form one body. Whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, we are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so the body is made up of many, not made up of one part, but of many. In other words, each person is part of the body. But they're all baptized by one spirit to form the one body. You got it? My finger is a different part than my toe. My leg is a different part than my arm. My head is a different part than my knees. But it still forms one body. See, and they all work together. But they're all baptized by one spirit to form the one body. And this is where the deception comes, you guys. And I know some of the things I'm saying might be challenging. They might be harsh. But sometimes you have to be harsh for people to hear the truth. You know, there's a video going on right now all over the, all over the web. And uh, I, this is probably the most harsh video I've ever heard anybody speak. I've never heard a person say more F-bombs and N-words and bad stuff online than I've ever heard of any video. But you know what? That one video put almost 2 million viewers in about, two week, in about a week. You know why? Because he's talking real to people. He's getting people to hear the message. I don't believe in his delivery, but guess what? He delivered the message. And I pray people heard it, because over 2 million people listen to it. People don't want to hear this message either, and I pray people hear this message. I don't pray some of you pastors that are teaching these doctrines that are inaccurate will repent. I pray some of the people that are listening to the message that have not been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin today. You say, you know what? He's right. What I'm seeing in the scriptures is right. That's different than what my pastor taught me. I'm going to obey the scriptures, and you will get baptized for the forgiveness of your sin so you can make it to the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm praying happens. I'm not saying this because I'm mad at you. I'm saying this because I care. It'd be much easier for me to sit down and do nothing. Much easier. Much easier for me to not teach this message and just take care of my family. That's it. Much easier. Much more difficult to call out the sin that I see. Much, e much more difficult. And this is the deception of the world. Let's keep. So baptism is mandatory for salvation and commanded by the Lord. That's one of the commandments of the Lord, is you've got to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. So number one, you've got to become a disciple of Jesus. That's number one. So have you made that decision to become a disciple of Jesus? You're watching right now online. Have you made the decision right now? I need to become a disciple of Jesus. That's it. I'm not going to follow my teachers anymore, my pastors anymore. I'm going to follow the scriptures. I'm going to follow God. He will reveal the truth to you. Have you made the decision? Have you made the decision to repent from your sins and to start getting rid of some of the sins? And you're going to see some more sins that, that's going on right now, too. But have you made the decision to repent? The next thing you need to do is get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. But let me tell you the next thing he tells them to do. After they're baptized, the next thing he says is you've got to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. He says you need to keep the commandments. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So what did the Lord teach them to command? command them to do? Keep the commandments. That's another thing that's not being taught out there, and this is a massive sin, and it's because of the deception. People say, oh, that's Old Testament. 
No, it's not. It's all throughout the Bible. Just pull up the word commandments in the scriptures on Google, and you'll see them all the way from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. You're going to see some right now. The commandments are mandatory. As a matter of fact, when the, what we would call today the New Testament was written, there was no New Testament. He had to be talking about the commandments of old because the, the New Testament wasn't written. So this is important. Look what it says in Matthew 22, verse 37 through 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. you got to love the Lord your God. Now, who's the Lord? Jesus. He's our Lord. He's our God. Let's read. John 14, 15 through 18. If you love me, keep my commandments. See, loving the Lord is keeping his commandments. If you're breaking his commandments and then you say you love the Lord, you're deceived. The Bible calls you a liar in 1 John. Look what it says. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and will be with you forever, the spirit of truth. See, when you keep the commandments, he's going to give you the spirit of truth. If you don't keep the commandments, guess what you have a spirit of? Deception. You understand? If you don't keep his commandments, you've got a spirit of deception going on. John 14, verse 20 through 21. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And we believe that's why God showed us this information two years ago, because as soon as we saw it, we obeyed the commandments to the best of our ability. The Lord's calling you right now back into his covenant. He wants you to keep his commandments. He wants you to keep his covenant. He wants you to love him, and showing how you love him is by keeping his commandments. That is disobedience to his commandments. It's the reason the Israelites didn't go into their promised land the first time. They didn't go in because they broke his covenant, his commandments. Read Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 through 68, and you'll see the, the punishment God put his people through because they disobeyed his commandments. It's going to be the same thing this time. It's just called the Great Tribulation. And it's not just for his Israelites anymore, it's for the entire world. So it's the same thing, no difference. Let's keep reading. 1 John 5, verse 1, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commandments. See, this is how we know we love the brothers in the body of Christ, is because we keep his commandments. In fact, this is the love for God, to keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. See, the Bible says if you're part of the world, you're not part of God. If, if the world is your life, that means you're not part of God. You're not part of, you don't have God in you. This is anyone who loves the world, hates God. That's the Bible says. So it's very important to understand is that keeping his commandments is, the, is a pivotal point in your life. So if you're not keeping the commandments, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good for you. Let's keep reading. Exodus 20, verse 4, it says, You should not make for yourself, these are, by the way, these are the Ten Commandments. It says, You should not make for yourself an image in the form of anything, in heaven above, and earth beneath, and the waters below. You should not bow down and worship them. For the, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Which is exactly what God has done. See, from the time God gave these commandments till now, has been 4,000 years. 1,000 years is the generation from God's perspective. So we're in the fourth generation right now. The third and fourth generation was the dark ages from Jesus until now. Guess what he's been doing? Punishing the children to the sins of the parents, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Because disobedience to his commandments is as if you're hating the Lord. Look what it says, verse 6, but showing love to a thousand generations who love me and keep my commandments. Let me ask you this, when do we get to live for a thousand generations? A thousand, thousand years when we're in spirit. See, he's going to show love to the people that keep his commandments for eternity. You know how long a thousand, thousand generations are? That's a long time. So this is what God is looking for. He's looking for people that want to be with him for eternity. But keeping his commandments is imperative to doing that. 
Let's read. Here's a couple more proofs of that. Matthew 19, verse 16, it says, Just then a man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing do I, must I do to get eternal life? And that's a great question. That should be the question all of you should ask. What do I need to do to get eternal life? Let me retranslate eternal life. That means go to heaven. That means being right with God. That means living with him forever in the kingdom of God. That's what that means. You know, that, that's what the meaning of eternal life is. So what good thing do I need to do to go to heaven? That would be a good way to answer. What does he say? Verse 17. Why do you ask me what is good? Do you reply there is only one who is good? If you want to enter life, Keep the commandment. That's what he says. If you don't want to enter life, don't keep the commandments. So in other words, if, let's translate it to heaven. If you want to enter heaven, keep the commandments. If you don't want to enter heaven, don't keep the commandments. If you want to live for eternity, keep the commandments. If you don't want to live for eternity, don't keep the commandments. That's what he's saying. We're trying to be as blunt and as simple as possible. So there's no misunderstanding. So when Jesus is there, and you're talking to him, and he's asking you, well, Lord, why didn't I make it into the kingdom of God? What happened? You don't have to ask your pastor what happens. At the twinkle of the night, the last trumpet, when the trumpet sounds, and the bride of Christ is gone, and the, the first fruit are gone in the kingdom of God, and you're left here behind, you don't need to ask your pastor what happened anymore. You know exactly what happened. Because you chose not to repent of your sin. You chose not to make Jesus Lord of your life. You chose not to get baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, and you chose not to keep his commandments. That's what happened. So then when the angels come to teach to you, you'll now know what to do. That's a whole other Bible study in itself. But this is so important for you to get. God wants you to know this message. Let's read. This is Revelation now. Now this is after all that. So after the great tribulation comes and all that, let's read what it says. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So who gets to go into the city? Those who do his commandments. Not those who know about his commandments. Not that who takes notes on his commandments. Not those who's read their commandments. Not who has those who has his commandments printed on their wall. No, those who do his commandments. You get it? I hope this is clear to you guys. The Lord wants you to hear this message loud and clear. This is what Peter taught back then. But see, a lot of them already kept the commandments. A lot of them already were of the feast days. They were there at the feast. The deception happened for the next 2,000 years, the third and fourth generation. We're the ones that were deceived, not the Bible. The Bible is clear. But as a matter of fact, they didn't even talk about the Sabbath that much in the Bible. Why? Because they were already all honored in it. They didn't have to. We're the ones deceived. We're the ones who Satan has deceived and use pastors to deceive us. So we need to repent. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, it says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Bottom line. All has been heard. You've heard the whole ways a lot of here. <laughs> this is all that's been heard. This is the conclusion of the matter right here. Figure out to keep the commandments. Now, there is uh, one commandment that's very important. Of the, of the commandments. Now, there's two commandments. But there's one commandment God carves out of those commandments that's even more important than the rest. Now, they're all important. Don't we'll get me wrong. None less important. But one of them is a super important one, and you'll see why in a minute. And it's the fourth commandment. And this is the one that almost no one remembers. As a matter of fact, it's the only one that he says to remember. All the rest of them was like, do not do this, do not do that, do not do this. This is the one he says to remember, and this is the one Satan helped with us all forget, which is the fourth commandment, which is this. Exodus 31, verse 12, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, remember, we're all Israelites now. There is no difference anymore in Christ Jesus. If you're baptized, you're all you're considered an Israelite. You're considered part of that uh, Abraham seed. So this is talking to you. You must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come. That's now. We're in the third and fourth generation. We're in the fourth generation. It's for the generations to come. Remember, they were already in the second generation. It's for the generations to come, which is now. You understand? This is a sign. So that you may know that I am the Lord who made you holy. 
See, if you're not honoring the Sabbath, you're not honoring the Lord of the Bible. The Bible says in, in the scriptures that there's going to be people that are going to masquerade as prophets of life, and they're going to be teaching another Jesus, and they're going to be talking about another spirit. If you honor a person or, or, or follow a leader, and they say you don't have to keep the Sabbath, you ain't following the Jesus of the Bible. You're following another Jesus. <laughs> I can tell you right now, you're following a different Jesus. If they're telling you you can get the Holy Spirit by a sinner prayer, you're following a different Jesus. you got you, you got a different spirit. This is spirit in you, probably, but it ain't the spirit of God. I can tell you that right now. So this is so important. This is the sign between God and his people. Look what it says, verse 14. It says, observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Those who do any work on that must be cut off through the people. See, people say, yeah, but he doesn't really mean that. Well, why don't you read number 15? And see what happened when the guy went out to go pick up some wood on the Sabbath. He went up to pick up some wood. The Lord, who was the same Lord as today, Jesus, he said, go get two witnesses and stone that man. And they stoned him immediately. It was a short passage. Very short. Because it's not like a lot of discussion. Because God didn't have grace back then. He said, you break the Sabbath, there's two witnesses, stone on these guys. End of it. And then he went on. There was no more talk about the guy. You understand? See, he came with grace and truth, so he gives us time to repent. That's what grace is. He's given us some, some time to repent. So right now, you've been breaking the Sabbath for the third or fourth generation, so you now can repent and start honoring the Sabbath. You're going to learn how today. Because look what it says. Anyone who desecrates it in the third or fourth generation is to be put to death. For six days, the work is to be done. But in the seventh day, the Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. Remember, this is for generations to come. This is for us. This is not for the generation they were talking about. It's for the generations to come. We are the generations to come. Let's keep reading. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign. The Sabbath, it, will be a sign between we and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses and Mount Sinai, he gave them the tombstone tablets of the covenant law, the tablets inscribed by the finger of God. And this is where the big deception comes. Well, we don't have to obey the law. You're right. There's a lot of those um, sacrificial laws, you know, sacrificing lamb for forgiveness of sin, and cutting your hair and wearing tassels and all these different things. Those are regulations that we had to do. We didn't have to do that. But this is different. These are the, the commandments that were on, this, on the two stone tablets. Those are the ten commandments. Those are the commandments we do have to do. We just saw a bunch of scriptures, even to enter the, the kingdom of God through the gates. It says we have to keep his commandments. And this just happens to be the fourth commandment, and it's the one that's assigned. Here's why it's assigned. Let me give you an example. Let's say you lined up a thousand Christians, people that call themselves Christian to go to church on Sunday, and they lined me up. And we were in line. And they said, okay, you got to now go to church on Sunday every, every week. Um, they're going to shoot me. Let me tell you why. Because I understand when the Sabbath is. Because I'm not going to break God's commandment to worship on Sunday. You understand? But all the Christians won't know the difference. Because they don't know when the Sabbath day is. Because it's not on Sunday. And it's not on Saturday night either. And you're going to see that in a minute. Because in the Bible, there was no Friday night, Saturday or Sunday. There was no Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday in the Bible. There's no January through December in the Bible. Those are all pagan God's names. God's not going to put his holy seventh day on a pagan day. So how do you get to the Sabbath day? This was a question we asked. Because we realized that all God's holy days were based on God's calendar. And we realized that the, the Sabbath, they had it on Friday night and Saturday night. It didn't make any sense. So if it don't make sense, you got to check and figure out what's the truth. So we did. So we looked it up. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Let me look at this scripture. Because a lot of people say, well, yeah, but, you know, the Sabbath, that was for the people in the Old Testament. Let's read the scripture. Hebrews 4, verse 6. It says, there since remains, in, I'm sorry, therefore, since it still remains for some into that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them didn't go in because of their disobedience, God said a certain day, called it today, as he did a long time ago when he spoke to David, and the pastor already quoted, today if you hear his heart, do not harden your heart. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. For if Joshua had given the rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. 
There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's not just for Israelites. It says, for anyone who enters God's rest, which is heaven, also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. See, the Israelites didn't go into the promised land because they were disobedient to God. Well, guess what? The people that are here now, that are watching this message, if you choose not to repent and start honoring God's Sabbath day based on his calendar, you're going to go through the Great Tribulation as well. It's the same thing. It's no different. The three. So how do we keep the seventh day holy? Now, you've got to remember, it was the seventh day. He made that in creation. So remember in creation, he spotted a new moon at night, and then he had a seven during the day. So it was a new moon. Because there was no sun or moon at that time. So he made a moon and a, and a sun on the first day. And then he had day and night, day and night, every every day. And then on the fourth day, he named it sun and moon. He said the sun governs the day and the moon governs the night. That's what he said. And he also made the stars. But he made it on the first day. And then he did work for six days. And on the seventh day, he rested, right? So the question is, in Genesis, what day was that? What day of the week? There was no day of the week. Because the Pope Gregorian calendar wasn't in existence yet. Pope Gregory wasn't born. There was no such thing as people that called themselves Jews, so it couldn't be Friday night and Saturday night, and the Pope didn't create Sunday keeping yet. So none of those could possibly be the seventh day. I hope that makes common sense to you in Genesis. So for up until the Israelites started being taught the, the Sabbath day, which was in Exodus 16, how did they get to the seventh day? How did they come up with it? Where, where was the beginning? Where did it start? How did you do it? If we were walking around the desert right now, we were Noah, and we wanted to honor the seventh day, how would we do it? Because there's no Gregorian calendar. There's no, um, there's no, you know, you know what I'm saying? There's no, we have no iPhones, we have no watch. How would we honor it? How would we do it? That was my question. How would we do it? Well, let's see what the Bible says. We look and spot the new moon, just like they did in Genesis. And the new moon is a little slipper. looks like that. And once we spot the new moon at night, that new moon, the next morning, is the first day of the month. And the Bible calls that day the new moon celebration. We celebrate the new moon. Now, here's the interesting thing that we saw in the scripture, because there's, there's books out there that you can read that does translation. The word moon in Hebrew means month. So it's the new month celebration. you got to remember, the Bible says the sun, moon, and stars were for signs, seasons, days, and years. So, and then we look at Isaiah 66, it says from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind are going to come to worship me. So a new moon means a new month. That means the year starts at the beginning, the month starts at the beginning, and the, and the seven days starts at the beginning. So we spot a new moon, and then we count the seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And isn't it interesting, the Sabbath day, the moon is a half a moon. Isn't that interesting? It's a perfectly a half a moon every seventh day. And then you go 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. If you would have went outside last night, you would see a perfectly full moon. Last night, because last night was the 14th day. Today is the 15th day of the month. Six, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Next Saturday, you will see a half a moon again, because it will be the 21st day of the month. And it will be a half a moon on the other side, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. And then it goes back to a sliver or a dark moon. Because God made the moon cycle the earth 29 and a half days. It rotates around the earth like this, the sun following it, just like that, because the earth is flat like here, and then it circles around the moon, around the earth, and then the sun and moon. That's how it works. And so when that happens, we spot the moon, and we count the seven. So that's how Noah honored the seventh day. That's how um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Israelites honored the seventh day. They spotted the moon, and they counted the seven. And here's the only scripture that talks about the second day of the month, which is 1 Samuel 20, verse 24 through 27. Read that scripture. And the reason why this is so important for you to understand this is because God wants you on his covenant. He's looking on his, on his Sabbath day to see who's honoring him. And now people all around the world are starting to honor him. 
this message is going to go all around the world, and people are going to be honoring him for everywhere. Because now people are going to understand the truth about the true Sabbath day. It's not Sunday, and it's not Saturday. It's not Friday night and Saturday night. It's based on God's calendar. So you can now be on God's calendar. So today, it happens to be the second Sabbath. Actually, yesterday was the second Sabbath of the third month on God's calendar. Very important to understand that. Then we go back out on the 29th day, and we spot the new moon again. That's how it works. That's how it works. Really simple. So here's the moons again. That's the first day. The next day after that is first day. First Sabbath, second, third, and fourth. Really simple. Child's play. Easy to understand. The question is, will you obey? That's the real question. Because God's looking for people that are willing to deny themselves and start honoring God's calendar. So if you're a congregation, let's say you have a church, and you've been honoring on Sunday, what you don't understand is you're honoring basically the Pope and the Son. It's not, it's not Son Jesus. He wants you to pull that entire congregation off and start keeping the truth out of the day. So here's the good thing. God stopped all those Sunday keepings, so now you can repent. But the question is, will you? That's the real question. That's now going to be the test of the heart for all these pastors out there that listen to this message. Will they, now that they have the opportunity, because now there's no more Sunday right now, right? You're all at home. So the question is, when you go back, will you start honoring God based on his calendar? Guess what? One day it's going to be on a Saturday. The next week, the next month, it's going to be on a Sunday. It might be on a Sunday. The next month, it might be on a Tuesday. The next one after that, it might be on a Wednesday. The next time, it be. Were you willing to do that? And guess what? Half your congregation is going to leave. Or more. Are you willing to deal with that? Because if they do, bottom line, are you, are you interested in their salvation and them honoring the Lord? Or are you interested in giving your tithe? Paying for your big building. God's going to check the heart. God's going to repent, you know, rebuke some of the people that are watching this message. Because this message is to help you bring you to God. Are you going to honor God on his, on his covenant, on his seventh day, or are you going to honor the Pope's seventh day? Whoever is teaching you follows who's disciple you are. So the Lord's here for you to share it to you. So these are the Lord's appointed festivals. Like I said, Leviticus 23, verse 1, these are the Lord's appointed festivals. They're not mine. They're not anyone else. These are the Lord's. So let's really look. So you got to really understand these really quick. The month of Aviv is when our year starts. The month of Aviv is when the barley is ripened. When the barley is ripened, that's when we start our, our year. You can read about that in, in, in Exodus 12, starting in verse 1, and then Exodus 13, starting in verse 1. It tells you all about it. We're not going to go through that today. But the new moon starts the new month, and that's called the new moon celebration. The seventh day is seven days after we spot the new moon. The Passover is when Jesus died and was fulfilled. Um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is when he was buried and that feast was fulfilled. Feast of First Fruit is when he rose and, and had the, the um, Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm sorry, and when he rose from the dead and that was fulfilled. Feast of Weeks is when he sent down the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Feast of Trumpets is when he called his people and we're, this is being fulfilled. The Day of Atonement is when he atoned for the nations and starts praying for the nations. This is being fulfilled. And the Feast of Tabernacles is when he sets up his kingdom and it's being fulfilled. That's what he's looking for right now, the people, so he can tabernacle with his body. He wants to tabernacle with the people that are wanting to obey him. So that's what the feast days look like. So you can start honoring them now. So here's the question you got to really ask yourself. Does this seem like a lot? You know, I know some people can say, man, this is so much information I need to learn. Yeah, but so is being a doctor. But you go to school for that for 30 years. 10 years, 20 years sometimes. And my sister went to school for 20, 30 years, to be honest. So sometimes people do go to school that long. You know, but the, some people go to school for 5 years, 10 years, 20 years to, to get into a career. How long will it take for you to learn this? A week or two, maybe? Is it worth it? Are you willing to die to yourself to, to learn this message? Or are you willing, oh, so, oh, so much, I can't do this. Okay, then you can't be a disciple. That's what Jesus will say. He's looking for people that are committed to him. This needs to be your life. And that's who the Lord's looking for. Because right now the Lord's calling. He's calling his people. And here's why. Because he wants to take them to the kingdom of God. Let's read. John 14, verse 1. It says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way, the place where I'm going. Now all of you that have listened to this message, you now know the way. See, this is the message Peter preached. Because they knew the way, they knew part of the way, but when he showed Jesus, then they knew the way. They knew the way. That's what was called the way in the book of Acts. Because that was the way. You now know the way. This is the same lesson that they preached back then. Because the Lord wants to take you to go be with him. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, it says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in the flash at the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. That's going to be such an exciting day, you guys. Then we hear that trumpet sound, and the twinkling of an eye will change. We get a new body. And we get to go be with the Lord. And we get to go sing His praises. And we get to go be with Him and go see this, 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 how big things are. He says, no, my, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind can conceive what he has in store for us. That's what we're looking for. Because I'm going to tell you right now, this earth and this world is gone. It's done. It's good as done. We're just seeing the beginning of it. We don't want to be here. We want to be with the Lord. This is who is calling. Revelation 3, verse 7, it says, To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who are holy and true. Who hold the keys of David. When he opens, no one can shut. When he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, those who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. See, God loves the Israelites. God loves the people that are called Israelites. That's who he loves. Not the people that call themselves Jews. They're actually the Canaanites, if you understand. They're the people that's, that is running the world, that's creating a lot of the havoc that most people don't know. He loves baptized disciples that are honoring him and keeping his covenant. Revelation 3.10, it says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. And that's exciting. And I can see how he's done that for the last 10 years of our life. He has kept us from the hour of trial. And the hour of trial that's going on right now, you guys, you think we're going back to normal? It's not going back to normal. We're just going, starting to go through that hour of trial right now. But he says he's going to keep us from that. He says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. To the one who is victorious, I will make the pillar of the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, this is who God's people are. This is that 144,000. I'm going to prove that right now to you. See, it's going to have the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and my new name written on their forehead. That's what it says. Let's see what those people are. Revelation 14, verse 1. It says, Then I looked, and there before me was a lamb, standing on Mount Zion, with him with 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. That is the church of Philadelphia. That's one of the seven churches. Only one. And we believe we're part of that church of Philadelphia. It says, verse 2, And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing water, and loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was that of a harp that's playing their hearts. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures of the elder. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. See, these are the people that are redeemed. These have been taken from the earth before that hour of trial happened. It says, these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they became remain virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruit to God and to the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouth, 
they are blameless. In other words, they didn't follow the woman, the false church, the Vatican, who infected all the churches out there, one of those 47,000 different denominations. So they didn't buy into all the false teaching of the false woman. That's what it means that they didn't defile themselves with women. They didn't defile themselves with false teaching. And they were first, that's first fruit. See, the first fruit are the ones that go first. After that, it's the great harvest. The people that come after, the ones that don't take the mark of the beast. There's a whole other video on our YouTube channel about that. But today, it's so important that you got to understand, you want to be the first fruit of the Lord. You want to be the first to rise from the dead. Or, that's alive and remain. You want to be the first. You don't want to go through the second group. It's not going to be good. Let's read. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. It says, Brothers and sisters, we, want you, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve of the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. We also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord will for himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of an archangel and with a trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left uh, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And that's what we're waiting for, brothers and sisters. That's what we're waiting for. That's why we're willing to do all these things that we're talking about. That's why we're willing to take our entire congregations off Sunday to keep me and start putting them on God's Sabbath day. That's why we're willing to honor the commandments no matter what it takes. That's why we're willing to honor the Sabbath day based on God's calendar and tell our jobs, I can't work on that day, and if we lose our job, that's okay because God will provide. That's why my daughter gets blessed for her jobs that she's getting because she's willing to honor the commandments. You know, that's why we get blessed in our life because he says he blesses those who take care of him and who does what he tells them to do and who obeys him. This is what we're waiting for, you guys. We're waiting to be the kingdom of God. So this is the message to the true disciples of Jesus. You're all Abraham's seed if. There's always an if. You're a true disciple. So you got to ask yourself right now, am I a true disciple? Not, not, not am I going to be. Am I right now? Have I been living up to this moment as a true disciple of Jesus? Have I died to everything? Have I pushed all my chips in, all in black, and said I'm all in with Jesus? He could have everything. Have you done that? If not, have you made a decision to right now? Have you made a decision from this point on? Your yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is ahead. And from this point on, I'm going to live for the Lord. Have you made a disciple the decision to be a disciple? Number two, am I willing to hold up to Jesus' teaching? What I see in the scripture. Versus what my pastor teaches, my own beliefs, what my parents teach, what I've been taught, and what I think I know. Are my willing to honor and honor what the scripture says and not what I think of what's important? Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to repent for my sins? Do I have hidden sins in my life that I need to confess? Are there sins that you need to confess? If there's some sins that are in your life and you want to talk to me, you can contact me. You, you got the website, you got my email and my phone number. You can call me. We can, we can talk about it, help you purge that sin out of your life. Talk to my wife. You can talk to us, help us get that sin out of your life. Now, we don't purge the sin. We just help you get it out. God forgives the sin in a minute once you get baptized. We can help you get it out and get open with your life. If you're baptized, you need to be baptized. Have you made a decision to be baptized in the water so you can get your sins forgiven by the Lord? So the only reason why you confess to us and help us walk through that is to be healed so we can help you heal through that process. When you go get baptized, that's when your sins are forgiven. That's what God puts the Holy Spirit in you, so now you can fight sin. You have the power to fight the sin. Are you willing to do the Ten Commandments, not just know about the Ten Commandments? To obey them, to obey all of them, to obey the fruit of the Spirit, to obey God's commandments, to love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know you're my disciple if you love one another. Do you show love in your life? Are you that kind of a disciple, or are you willing to do that? 
Will you keep the seventh day holy based on God's time that you've learned today? You now have learned it. Now you cannot go to Jesus and say, I didn't know Sunday wasn't the Sabbath. You can't say that no more. You can't say, I didn't know Friday night and Saturday night wasn't the Sabbath. You now know. You can't say, you can't say, I didn't know any day could be the Sabbath. I thought any day could be the Sabbath. If that's what your pastors and leaders and Bible talk leaders were teaching you, it's a false doctrine. I don't care what book wrote it. It's a false doctrine. The question is, are you willing to honor God's seventh day based on his calendar now? Now that you do know. And are you really ready and waiting? When the Lord comes, are you re ready and waiting with, with bated breath? So I know one thing. For me, I am sick and tired of this world. Not just sick. You know, some people could be sick of this world. Some people could be tired of this world. I am sick and tired. If Jesus took me right this very second, I'd be a okay. It wouldn't matter. I don't need any of that. I don't need. There's nothing on earth I want. Nothing. No amount of money. Someone give me a billion dollars, it would be like $10. I mean, God yeah, might be able to get a little more stuff or whatever, but I, that, yeah, I don't care. I, I don't care. I don't care. I want to be in the kingdom of God. That's it. I don't need any more money. I don't need any fame, any success. I don't need any cars, any houses, any trips and vacations. I don't need nothing. If I get it, great. If I don't get it, I'm 100% okay. I have learned... The secret to contentment, like the Bible says. You know, I'm looking for one thing. I got one hope. It has to be in the kingdom of God. And that's what God wants. That's what he's looking for. And that's a very narrow road. And most people won't find it. The question is, is he going to find it in you? Is he going to find it in you? Let's go back to where we started, Acts 2, 36. This is what Peter preached. That's what this Pentecost is all about. It says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. You know how you crucified him? By disobeying the Sabbath day. That's what Jesus was on the cross. That's a sin. No different than any other sin of the Ten Commandments. You know how you crucified him? By all the sins of, of, of commission. You know, by, by lust and by impurity, by immorality, by your deceitfulness, by your lying, by the, the part how you've been living. That's what put Jesus on the cross. You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. You put him on the cross, and every time you commit another sin, you're trampling him over foot. You're still committing over and over again. You killed Jesus. You put him on that cross. Not the people that did it back then. You do it every day the way you live. So are you going to repent? See, because when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other brothers, what should we do? That should be your heart right now. What should I do? Peter replied, repent. Repent means turn away from your sins. Start honoring the Ten Commandments. Start honoring God's Sabbath day based on his, his commandments. Stop honoring all the pagan holidays and start honoring the feast, Lord's feast days. Start honoring them immediately. And be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a promise. It was for you, it was for your children, and it was for all who will fall off, for all who the Lord God will call, which is all of you that listen to this message right now. It's for all of you that will listen to this message online. This message, every donation that's given to us is going to be spent on spreading this message around the world until Jesus comes. This message is going to be preached until he comes to get his people. And we're going to get to millions upon millions of people until that 144,000 are in. And everyone else is ready for the angels to come to teach you. I pray you're one of the 144,000. I pray you make that decision today. Peter said, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. And I'm going to say the same thing right now. I've been pleading with you today. This message has been a plea from God. There's pastors all around the world right now that have seen this message, that are taking this message, and that are preaching it to their congregations. We have hundreds and hundreds of people being baptized. We pray thousands of people will be baptized. We pray 30,000, 50,000 people will be baptized. 
We pray that people all around the world will hear this message, repent for their sins, go get baptized so they can make it to the kingdom of God. Because we don't know how many of the 144,000 are left. We don't know if it was 143,000 or was there two people left. We don't know. But we pray that this message will go as far and as wide as God will take it. Because it says here in verse 41, it says, those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And we know that this message has not been taught for 2,000 years. Since Peter preached it the first time 2,000 years ago. And it was nowhere near as much that we had to go through today because it wasn't much deception as there is today. But this message now has been preached to you. The message has now been preached to you. You've now heard the message of the kingdom of God. There is no more excuse. God's grief period is almost up. He's coming to get his people. And he's coming soon. The real only question is, how many of you are going to accept this message? Because the only people that were baptized and added to the body of Christ in Peter's day were those that accepted this message. Everyone else that didn't accept the message are not going to be raised when Jesus comes. The question is, are you going to accept this message? That's the question. Are you going to accept this message? I pray you do. Because Jesus is coming. Let's end it off in prayer. Father God, I just want to come to you right now. Thank you. Thank you so much for this message, God. Thank you so much for giving us 2,000 years to repent giving us 2,000 years of grace from the time Peter preached it the first time to now. Father, I pray that you come soon. I pray that you come today. The sooner the better. And I pray that people that hear this message will run, not walk, to go get their sins forgiven, to make a decision, to be a disciple. Father, I pray that people will hear this message and it will go as far and as wide as you'll let it until you come. Father, I pray for people who hear the message and they repent and they make a decision. They're not going to follow the pastors. They're not going to follow their leaders. They're going to follow the scriptures. And if someone teaches something different than what's in the Bible, they're going to follow the Bible. The Bible is going to be the final answer. And Father, I pray that you help thousands upon thousands become disciples. Get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Start honoring the commandments. Keep this Sabbath day holy so they can make it to the kingdom of God and be with you in paradise. We love you. We thank you so much for this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray.